Hello, and welcome to our webinar, The Science and Practice of LSVT Loud, Speech Treatment for Parkinson's Disease. My name is Beth Peterson, and I'm joined by my colleague, Angela Halpern. We're very excited to be here today presenting to you on the topic of LSVT Loud. Before we get started, we do like to acknowledge our funding support, which has helped make LSVT Loud possible and what it is today. We've had funding support from the National Institutes of Health, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the Parkinson Alliance and the Davis Finney Foundation. I'm going to briefly go over the plan for the webinar so you know what to expect. First, I'll cover some logistics, then we'll do a brief introduction of the presenters here today, and then we're going to discuss the development and the research data on an efficacious speech treatment, LSVT Loud. And then we'll also introduce some additional uh, developments, the physical therapy approach, which is LSVT Big, and then also talk about some technology-assisted delivery of LSVT Loud. And then we should have some time at the end of the presentation for some question and answer. So I'm going to briefly introduce, oh, actually, sorry, before I do our introductions, I did want to go over these logistics. So just so that you know, everyone in the audience right now, your microphones are automatically muted, and that's just to make sure that we don't have background noise from the various environments where you're joining us. But if you do have a question at any time during the webinar, there are a few ways to ask your questions. The first is to raise your hand. And you can do that by clicking on the hand icon on your webinar control panel. I'll then see that you have a question and you have your hand raised. And I'll unmute your microphone and call out your first and last name and you can ask your question aloud to the group. The second way is to type in your question and you can do that by clicking in the question box on your webinar control panel. You can then type in your question. We'll see the text of your question. I'll read that text out loud and then Angela or myself will respond. And the third way is to email us, and that's really at any time. I'll display that email address at the end, but it's info as an in information. So info at lsvtglobal.com. And then I also wanted to point out um, that we have a handout available. I think you were emailed this before the webinar, um, but we also have it available on your webinar control panel. You should have a handouts tab on your control panel. If you click the plus sign on that tab, then you'll see a link to the handout for today, and it will take you to a, a website uh, URL. And from there, you'll be able to download it or print it um, or save it to your computer. Um, and then we'll also email it to you after the webinar just to make sure that everyone was able to access that. Um, but if you are able to access it now, you can go ahead and take notes on it during the presentation today. So now I'll go ahead and briefly introduce myself and Angela. Angela is the Chief Clinical Officer with LSVT Loud. She's also part of the clinical research team at the National Center for Voice and Speech in Denver, um, where she does research on LSVT Loud. And she's also one of the LSVT Loud training and certification faculty instructors. Um, my name is Beth Peterson. I'm the Chief Technology Officer with LSVT Global, and I'm also one of the LSVT Loud training and certification faculty members. I've also been a part of the LSVT Loud clinical research team at the National Center for Voice and Speech in Denver, where most of the research on LSVT Loud has been conducted and continues to be conducted under the direction of Dr. Lorraine Ramig. So we're both very excited to greet you today from Denver, Colorado, and present to you on a topic that we both really have a lot of passion about. In terms of CEUs, this webinar is offered for 0.1 CEUs. Uh, attendance for the full hour is required to earn CEUs. Um, after completion of the webinar, you'll receive a certificate uh, within two weeks of the webinar. Um, and if you're a speech language pathologist, uh, this you'll get the certificate, but it's not part of a, it's not an ASHA registered CEU activity. So um, you will need to maintain the certificate, and it won't be automatically reported to your ASHA CE registry. So you will want to keep that certificate. Um, for disclosures, all of the LSVT Global faculty have both financial and non-financial relationships with LSVT Global. The non-financial relationships include a preference for LSVT Loud as a treatment technique and the equipment which will be discussed as part of this webinar. Both Angela and myself are employees of and receive lecture honorarium and travel reimbursement from LSVT Global. And I'd like to briefly go over the learning objectives. Um, so the objectives today are to we hope that at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to explain advances in neuroscience and the importance that they have on the field of rehabilitation. 
Then also be able to discuss the development and data on LSVT Loud, which is an efficacious voice and speech treatment. We also hope you'll be able to describe the development and key aspects of the limb motor treatment, which is LSVT Big, which is the physical and occupational therapy approach. And then also be able to outline future direct directions and alternative modes of treatment delivery using technology, which we'll spend some time on at the end of the presentation. So we'll go ahead and get started in the heart of our presentation here. And we really like to recognize that it's a stunning time for us to be in the field of rehabilitation today. The basic science evidence that documents the positive value of exercise, in particular in Parkinson's disease and animal models of Parkinson's disease, have raised the value of using exercise and exercise-based rehabilitation as a therapeutic option for people with Parkinson's. So classically, Parkinson's was predominantly treated neuropharmacologically and surgically. Oftentimes, rehabilitation only occurred later in the disease, where we really weren't able to treat the primary characteristics of bradykinesia and hypokinesia, um, but rather we were often treating secondary consequences such as aspiration pneumonia from swallowing challenges or a hip fracture from a fall. So today we know that the key exercise, the key principles of exercise can drive this concept of activity-dependent neuroplasticity and the changes in the brain that are dr driven by activity of the body. And with that, in animal models of Parkinson's, it's demonstrated that it can improve brain functioning and the goal is to potentially slow disease progression. So even if we can't slow the disease, perhaps we can slow or minimize the symptoms of the disease. So today we have this concept that exercise is medicine and it's really an important part in the care of Parkinson's. The next slide you'll see here kind of a Venn diagram. And um, as I mentioned, it's now rehabilitation. So both voice and body exercise are considered legitimate therapeutic options. So both for symptomatic relief and to improve function. So we have these three circles of treating Parkinson's disease. We have the pharmacological treatments, the neurosurgical treatments, and today, just as important are those voice and body exercises. So you'll see that these circles overlap. It's not just one or the other. Most often it's the right combination of all of these or one, of two of, one or two of these. And then as the disease changes, adding one or another to ultimately provide individuals with Parkinson's the best management of their Parkinson's and their best quality of life to keep them living and doing all the things they want to be able to do. So next I'll show you a video example. Um, this is Shirley. She was 59 years old at the time of the video and she was two and a half years post diagnosis of Parkinson's. She's on her medications both before and after in the video and you see her before and after receiving LSVT Loud. Um, and, and when you see her post, it's right after her 16 sessions of treatment. So let's go ahead and take a look at her video. And I will say sometimes the videos, depending on your computer setup or network connection, they don't play as great as we would like them to play. So a lot of these videos we have on our website. So if you aren't able to get them to play well during the webinar today, if you go to lsvtglobal.com, and click on um, video and news, then you'll be able to see some of the videos from today. So we'll go ahead and play Shirley here. Have you noticed any changes in your speech or your voice that you would associate with Parkinson's? Yes, I don't speak loud enough a lot of times. Anything else? Of course. Uh -huh. Anything else? I stutter, which I never did before. Do this for me if you would. Take a deep breath and say ah for as long as you can. Ah. Uh... Good for you. Okay. Would you say Parkinson's disease has caused you to talk less? Yes. Because? Because I stutter and then I can't be heard. If there's noise in the house, like when the kids come over, nobody pays attention to it because they can't hear me. Until I get mad and then yell. Take a deep breath and say ah for as long as you can. Ah. Have 
have you noticed changes in your speech or your voice as a result of the speech therapy? Oh, yes. What have you noticed? I talk louder. I think louder. <laughs> I'm going to sing with the Son of the Sons of Pioneers one of these days with my, my voice. <laughs> Good for you. That's excellent. Uh, what practicing do you do at home? My odds, my highs, and my lows. And I read out the, the mail out loud. Excellent. Do you feel like practicing helps? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, do you feel as though people can understand you all of the time now? Majority of the time, unless it's my husband. They're going to say, well, I can't hear you. Good for you. But I think he does that just to be cute. I think he does, too. <laughs> Has anyone commented that it's easier to understand you now? Oh, yes. I set some of our friends back when we went to their house, and I talked loud. Lou says, what the heck do you? <laughs> My daughter said, oh, Ma, that's you? <laughs> Isn't that good? Don't you feel wonderful? Oh, yeah, because now she can't say, I didn't understand what you said. Right? No excuses, right? Yeah, that's no right. excuses. All right. So what do you do when you want to be as easy to understand as possible? Think loud. Okay, so hopefully that video played okay for you, and I hope you could hear the changes in Shirley pre to post. So obviously her voice was louder, and that's really the main target of treatment, but in addition to that loudness, you may have heard her quality of her voice improved, the articulation improved, her clarity of speech was better, and more globally, you could probably appreciate changes in things like her facial expression and overall confidence in, in changes in personality. So those other changes aren't uncommon and that are and they're secondary to the behavior intervention that we're doing. Oftentimes when people with Parkinson's complete exercise-based neurorehabilitation programs, such as LSVT Loud or LSVT Big, which we'll talk about, they really gain confidence that they can control some aspect of their Parkinson's beyond their drugs and, and waiting for that medicine to kick in. So that's really an exciting feature of doing the LSVT Loud treatment. So I'm going to go over the background and development for LSVT Loud and kind of walk you through where there was a critical need for speech treatment in Parkinson's. This is a picture of Mrs. Lee Silverman, and as you can see, she's in a wheelchair. She had many other medical um, problems associated with her Parkinson's, but when Dr. Lorraine Ramig first met her, her family said, if only we can hear and understand her. That was their desire for, uh, for Mrs. Lee Silverman. Um, so as you all realize, communication is a major problem for family members uh, in patients with neurological disorders. While the physical limitations of the disease may be challenging, that inability to communicate with your loved one with Parkinson's can often be the most challenging. So Mrs. Lee Silverman is who LSVT Loud is named after, so it's a Lee Silverman voice treatment. And so a little bit on that background and where we began. Um, it was back in 1987, and LSVT Loud began as the, the idea at the Lee Silverman Center for Parkinson's in Scottsdale, Arizona. And Dr. Ramig and one of her students, Carolyn Mead Bonatati, worked together and evolved what is now known as the LSVT Loud. So back in 1987, there was no effective speech treatment for Parkinson's disease, despite having 6 million people worldwide um, with Parkinson's. Um, so 89% of the people diagnosed with Parkinson's will develop some type of speech or voice problem during the course of the disease. Um, but only in the past, only about 4% were receiving traditional speech therapy. Um, so there's a big gap between the, the, you can see, the number of people that will have some type of voice or speech issue and those that were receiving treatment. The reason they weren't receiving treatment in the past was there was a consensus that speech treatment just didn't work for people with Parkinson's, so there was no point to do it. Um, the, the more traditional approaches that were used in the past were articulation or working on rate at low dosages, and, and that's likely why there were no impacts on the, the, the system. And so we'll talk about how LSVT Loud differs from those previous more traditional methods of treatment. So in terms of medical management, um, on the one hand, most patients do receive some sort of neuropharmacological treatment, so the drugs, um, dopamine agonists, levodopa, etc. And on the other hand, uh, 
oftentimes or or more recently people are receiving deep brain stimulation or neurosurgical treatment to help relieve some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, but what we're finding and um, what research is showing us is that these medical interventions are effective on the limbs um, but they have unestablished effects on speech so meaning that the drugs or the surgeries aren't necessarily helping um, the speech deficit that we're seeing with Parkinson's disease, which is why we have to do some type of behavioral intervention to help improve those voice and speech symptoms. So we'll take you through the journey of creating a treatment that works. So we'll go from discovery through efficacy, so showing that the treatment works through research, and we'll talk about the fundamentals of the therapy and also the efficacy data or those outcomes um, that we find through the research um, in the treatment. So the primary perceptual characteristics that have been observed by many researchers for people with Parkinson's disease are reduced loudness, hoarse voice quality, monotone and pitch, imprecise articulation, um, possibly a vocal tremor. And one interesting finding is that some patients do report volume or the hoarse voice or having a monotone pitch as their first symptom of Parkinson's disease, so before they even notice the other characteristics of Parkinson's. And here are data that were published many years ago that compare the sound pressure level or vocal loudness for people with Parkinson's disease uh, compared to an age-matched healthy control group. So that's what the HC stands for, so a group that did not have Parkinson's disease. And these data were collected across a variety of speech tasks, ranging from sustained phonation of ah, so just saying ah, all the way to conversation. So the the sound pressure level or the, the volume is on the vertical axis here and then you see the people with Parkinson's disease are in yellow and those without Parkinson's disease or the healthy controls are in red. And you can see that across the tasks here, the people with Parkinson's disease are two to four decibels softer than that age um, matched control group um, without Parkinson's disease. So the next set of data here that you see. Uh, we really wanted to look at does this reduction in volume make any type of difference? So these data plot patient self-perception of their ratings of communication. And so we see the individuals with Parkinson's in yellow and those without Parkinson's in red. And what you see overall is that patients with Parkinson's disease were less likely to participate in conversations or have confidence in their voice compared to that healthy age match control group. So this data helps us see that yes, this speech problem does make a difference. And even more so than the data that we have, the, the quotes from patients really support this fact even further, and that's what really drives us to do the research that we do um, with, with this population. Um, so we have some quotes from the past, if I have no voice, I have no life, or no one listens to me anymore. Um, Miller and his colleagues had a have a quote in one of their, their papers that shows that people with Parkinson's disease live for years frustrated by communication impairment, withdrawal, social isolation, and embarrassment. So we really see from um, the perspective of individuals with Parkinson's that yes, the speech problem does have an impact on their quality of life, and that's why we wanted to address that issue. So this slide just shows you the over 20, now it's over 25 years, I think, the 25 plus year journey from invention to scale up um, with LSVT Loud and where it got started. Um, so they, they had a series of funding grants from the Office of Education and the National Institute of Health to run a series of randomized control trials to evaluate the efficacy of LSVT Loud and to really understand the changes occurring in the speech production system in patients before and after receiving LSVT Loud. So this helped understand the basic mechanism of change. In addition, there was also funding to do imaging studies to understanding what, what's happening at the brain level of someone with Parkinson's disease after they have successful treatment. And then simultaneous to establishing this research base of treatment efficacy and those underlying changes, the team was also motivated to scale up access to this treatment. So on the one hand, um, our team has worked to train speech clinicians so that treatment is available to more patients. At the same time, we're turning to technology to offer patients ways to make it easier to have access to speech treatment. Um, so some things we'll talk about later in the presentation, telehealth delivery. Um, we also had funding from the National Institutes of Health and the Michael J. Fox Foundation in a software development 
so that patients can actually practice on their own or have easier ways to do follow-up treatment. So through this research that you see, we've worked at multiple level levels and continue to work at these levels to establish that research base so that efficacy is well established. We understand the fundal me fundamental mechanism associated with treatment-related changes so that we can continue to improve treatment. And then we're also turning to, to ways that we can scale up access to this treatment approach so that that treatment that's well established in the research lab can be delivered to patients globally, so all around the world. So I'll now talk about LSVT Loud and the three paradigm shifts that make LSVT Loud different from traditional speech therapy. I'm going to talk about the target of treatment, which is targeting healthy vocal loudness, which is the only target of treatment. And then we'll also talk about the mode of delivery, which is intensive and high effort. Um, and then we'll also talk about a calibration component. So that calibration component help helps to address the elements that get in the way of generalizing those new treatment effects outside of the treatment room. So LSVT, in summary, will have a target of loudness, a mode of delivery that's intensive, intensive and high effort, and also has a focus on calibration. So let's look at a slide to really show you, even though we focus on only one target, which is healthy vocal loudness, we see a spread of effects into other areas as well. So if you think back to that Shirley video, in her treatment, she only focused on loudness, but we saw those other changes such as articulation, her voice quality improved. Um, so just a couple examples there. So we'll do a little kind of demonstration at your home or your office or wherever you are today. So in your normal voice, go ahead and say, how are you? So how are you? And so this is likely how you look if you look at this kind of side view of the speech mechanism on your slide here. And um, if you now I'm going to have you say, how are you in a loud voice? So how are you? Okay, so if you've done that, we'll go ahead and look at the second kind of side view here, and we see the difference in your whole speech system just by focusing on loudness. So without even thinking about it, when you increase your loudness, you automatically took a deeper breath, you closed your vocal folds more, you opened your mouth more, your tongue, your lip, and your jaw moved more, and out came louder, more intelligible speech. And the key element with that is that you did it without even thinking about it. So imagine that you can make these changes across your speech production system with only one target. So think loud. You can use that one simple target of increasing loudness to make the coordinated changes across the entire speech production system. And that's really the fundamental element of what we do with LSVT Loud. So in terms of mode, it's intensive and high effort. So it's intensive dosage. Um, in terms of there's 16 sessions of treatment and each treatment session is one hour in duration. So there's 16 sessions in one month because um, they're, they're four consecutive days a week for four, four consecutive weeks. And there's also intensity within sessions. So we're working to high effort levels within every treatment session for that entire hour. So we have high effort because there's multiple repetitions of all the exercises. Um, we're building up force uh, and resistance. We're also working to improve accuracy and working patients to healthy fatigue. So you get that, again, that intensity and high effort across the 16 sessions of treatment and then also within each individual treatment session. And the data show us that intensive practice is important for maximal plasticity or, or making those maximal changes in the brain. And so if you think back to that previous slide, um, where it showed that just speech treatment didn't work in the past, and, and those were low dosages of treatment, and, and likely that's why we didn't see the changes in the past that we do now when we have this intensive high effort treatment approach. And then lastly, with calibration, um, so with Parkinson disease, there's a mismatch in between the online perception of a patient's output of their speech and how others perceive their speech. So oftentimes we hear individuals with Parkinson's say, I'm not too soft. Um, and they'll think that the world needs a hearing aid, that it's not them, it's everybody around them. And then when they're asked to get louder, we often hear, I can't speak like this, I'm shouting. So in LSVT Loud, we're addressing that sensory problem in Parkinson's disease. And there's sensory gating literature documenting that individuals with Parkinson's disease do have this sensory mismatch. 
So when vocal loudness is within normal limits, individuals with Parkinson's disease perceive it as too loud. And so that's really the sensory problem that we're addressing to make sure the changes that we make in the treatment room do carry over outside of treatment into an individual's everyday living. And so through that target of increasing loudness, the mode, which is intensive and high effort, and that calibration, so making sure that individuals now can internally cue themselves to use that louder voice, we're increasing that amplitude of output um, so that they, they can and will use this new loud voice outside of treatment all the time, and, and it becomes more automatic. So I'm going to turn it over to Angela now, and she's going to get into the efficacy data and show you some of the research that's been done on LSVT Loud. And then she'll also talk a little bit about LSVT Big. Well, thank you, Beth, for that great overview. And I'm very happy to be here with all of you here today. Um, as Beth mentioned, I'm now going to talk with you um, about some of the efficacy data regarding LSVT Loud. And we think it's important to share this data with you so that if you are an individual with Parkinson's and you decide to participate in the treatment or if you're a therapist delivering the treatment, you can feel confident that the treatment um, you're investing your time and energy into is well researched and supported by data. Next slide, please. In addition to the outcomes in loudness, research on LSVT Loud over the last 25 plus years has established, as Beth referred to earlier, what we call the spreading of effects. So what we mean by this is that even though the treatment is focused on the voice, we see a cross-system effect to other areas as well. So this diagram demonst demonstrates some of the research documenting these cross-system effects. We have a full reference list um, for some of these that are referenced on this diagram here on our website, or if you let us know here during the webinar that you'd like that full reference list, we're happy to send it to you. This just gives you a few examples. So we've seen, in addition to our improvements of loudness, when we look at the spreading of effects, significant improvements in other areas such as articulation, respiration, facial expression, and we have some uh, demonstrations of actual physiological changes at the level of the vocal folds, which we'll talk about in just a bit um, more. And also some preliminary data showing changes in swallowing and neural functioning as me measured by positron emission tomography, or PET imaging. And I will show you more data on the swallowing and the PET imaging in just a bit. So it's exciting that just by focusing on loudness, we're seeing a cross-system effect to these other areas as well. Next slide, please. So our research data have, as I mentioned, demonstrated some of these physiological changes at the level of the vocal folds. In LSVT Loud, we're increasing effort across the motor speech system to achieve a voice that's at a normal loudness level. The video I'm going to show you now is an image of the vocal folds pre-LSVT loud and then post-LSVT loud. And what we see in some individuals with Parkinson's disease is that the vocal folds might be what we call bowed, meaning um, they don't come completely together. And this can lead to a hoarse, quiet, or breathy voice. What we've seen in our research and what's been documented by an article published by Smith et al. is a change in this function to better vocal fold closure following LSVT loud. So what we're going to do is, um, as we play the video, I'm going to talk you through it because some people, you may not have seen an image of vocal folds before, so I'll orient you a bit to what you're seeing. So let's go ahead and take a look at that video now. So we're looking at here, these, the white that you can see in the image, those are the vocal folds, and it's just been opened, you can see the entrance to the airway. And when this person is phonating, when the vocal folds come together, there's still a gap. You can see that dark area in between, so you're not getting complete closure. Now, following LSVT, Let's look at the white of the vocal folds as they come together on the closed phase. When they're completely closed, you see there's no longer a gap. 
So this is showing that improvement in that physiological function of better vocal fold closure following the treatment, which is four times a week for four weeks of LSVT loud. Next slide, please. But what about the long-term effects of LSVT loud? Our data show some nice pre-post changes, but what happens in the long term? People previously have said that changes in the treatment room disappear on the way to the parking lot for treatments they had done with individuals with Parkinson's disease. But what I'll show you in our next slide here are some data that look at changes following LSVT out to two years. So we're looking at changes in the main target of treatment, which is increasing loudness over time. This data was published by Ramig et al. in 2001. So if you look at the vertical axis, you're seeing loudness levels as reported while reading a rainbow passage, and this is just a standardized reading passage. And then if you look at the horizontal axis, you see time documented and plotted here. The red line is the LSVT loud group, so people who focused on four times a week for four weeks of treatment doing LSVT loud. The blue line was a group of individuals who also received treatment four times a week for four weeks, but their treatment was focusing on intensive work on respiration, and this was targeted because people in Parkinson's can notice decreased respiration. So two targets that are noticed as having um, people noting difficulties in those areas. If you look at the graph, you see going from the zero mark, which is pre, up to the post mark, you can um, see indicated improvements in sound pressure level for both groups, but at a higher level for the LSVT loud group. And then if we go out to six months, we see that there is a decrease in loudness for the LSVT group, but still louder than the respiratory group and also louder than the pretreatment levels. And then these levels continue to be maintained out to 12 and 24 months. So it's not saying that treatment results may not last longer than two years, but it's just this graph is showing you two years is how long um, in this group of subjects that we had studied to look at the changes. Next slide, please. So we just talked about these improvements in vocal loudness, which is the treatment target, but as we have mentioned previously, in addition to changes in vocal loudness, we've also seen a spreading of effects to other areas that we were not directly targeting, including articulation, speech, expression, and the brain imaging. We're continuing to study these areas and hope to have more data and information soon. We just finished another research grant in 2012 where we had an additional 60 individuals with Parkinson's disease participating, as well as 20 individuals that were age matched without Parkinson's. And so we'll have a wealth of new data regarding swallowing and facial expression, and then um, a subset of subjects who were doing some more brain imaging and more data about that to come soon. Next slide, please. But let's look now at some of this preliminary data in swallowing. And we say it's preliminary because in this study there were only eight subjects, but as I mentioned, we'll have more data coming soon. Um, so in this slide, what you're looking at is the pink is before LSVT and the yellow is after LSVT. And this is looking at measurements of oral residue percentage. So basically, how much food or liquid was left in the mouth after a swallow. And these are based on um, ratings that people are looking at of someone who's had an x-ray of their swallowing. So food or liquid is put in the mouth, the person swallows, it's all an x-ray, and so they can see during this moving film how much residue is left and they rate it. Why this is important is that the more residue left in the mouth is indicative of a less efficient swallow. So if the swallow isn't as efficient, food or liquid isn't getting moved out of the mouth, so less food or liquid would be indicative of improvements in this oral phase of the swallowing. So what you can see in this graph is that, in fact, across 1 milliliter, 3 milliliters, 5 milliliters, 10 milliliters, the cup, and paste and cookie is what was measured, 
For most of these, there's less residue left in the mouth following the swallow. We didn't see these changes in the cookie. Um, so that's just, once again, some preliminary data looking at the efficiency of that oral phase. Right now, we're not saying that LSVT loud is a treatment used to directly treat swallowing, but what we are saying is that perhaps if you, um, if an individual is participating in LSVT loud for their voice, maybe they might notice some clinical changes in their swallow as well. So we'll have more information on this soon when we do the comparison of uh, these additional 60 individuals um, who had swallowing studies before and after the treatment phase. Next slide, please. In this slide, we're looking at some of the preliminary brain imaging data. So this was done with PET imaging. And if you're not familiar with looking at um, PET scan imaging, basically the more red on the imaging is indicating more activity. So the top row here is pre-LSVT during a sustained ah, and the bottom is post-LSVT during a sustained ah. So if we go through, um, if we go through across these slices, what what we see is pre-LSVT more activity in the supplemental motor area and less post um, pre. LSVT in the top here, we see less activity in the right putamen, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and the right anterior insula, but then post, you see more activity in all of these areas. So what is, this is indicating is a right-sided shift in function following LSVT. This data was published by Liotti et al., and there was a follow-up study, which still had a small sample size, but had some additional subjects, and it showed similar results to this initial study. So um, more people have been imaged, and hopefully we'll have more data for you soon about this. Next slide, please. So all of this data is great to demonstrate how and why the treatment works, but what is equally as important are the comments that we receive from our patients. So when our patients say things like, my voice is alive again, I can talk to my grandchildren, I feel like my old self, I am confident I can communicate. This is what's important. This is the real life impact that the treatment is having on the everyday lives of our patients. Next slide, please. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to actually walk you through a little bit about um, the LSVT loud exercises so you can see what would happen in a session. So I'll provide you with an overview of what happens and um, then we'll actually practice a few of these exercises with some video clips in just a bit. So the first half of every one hour LSVT loud session contains the daily tasks. And with these daily tasks, these are our strengthening tasks for the voice. And so we're rescaling amplitude, meaning increasing to normal loudness, um, and rescaling that through the motor output through these core loudness exercises. So what we do every day are a minimum of 15 sustained ahs. So we have individuals do ah and hold it out for as long as they can with good loudness and good quality. And then we do a minimum of 15 highs and a minimum of 15 lows. These are meant to be a stretch. They're not a singing exercise. It's a pitch stretch. We see in some individuals with Parkinson's that their voices have become more, become more monotone. So this is a pitch stretch to address that. So with the highs and lows, we would do a ah. Or if it was a low, we would do a ah. And then we have individuals come up with 10 things that they say every single day. And we practice these 10 phrases a minimum of five times each session. The purpose of this is that then, because we have practiced these so much in this new normal loudness voice, that when someone goes outside of the treatment room and happens to say something such as, what's for dinner, in their normal loudness voice, it hooks them into remembering to be loud outside of the treatment room. So the first half of the session stays the same through these core training variables. 
The second half of the session is where things are um, different for each session. So here we're training amplitude from those core exercises that we did in the first half of the session into speaking and reading tasks. We start simple and gradually get more complex. And week one is at a word phrase level. So we do reading at a word phrase level and answering short, simple conversational questions at a word phrase level. Week two is at a sentence level, reading and conversation. Week three is reading and conversation at a paragraph level. And week four is all at a conversational level. So the ultimate goal through everything that we do is getting good, normal loudness into conversational speech and working towards that goal. For reading and conversation, the therapist will pick activities that are personal and salient and important to the individual that they're working with. And we'll talk about that a bit more. Next slide, please. We're now going to practice one of the LSVT Loud exercises together. So you will see a sample clip that was taken from our Homework Helper DVD. And on this video, um, this is a video that's used to help people practice their LSVT Loud exercises at home, but in the video clip you'll see Dr. Fox introduce the exercise. You'll then see a stoplight. When the light turns green, I want you at home to all do the ah uh, together. So when the light turns green, we're going to go. So let's go ahead and take a look at this now. What you're going to do is sit up straight and do what I do. Uh, be sure to think about feeling the same loudness and effort that you used during your speech treatment sessions. When you're ready, you're going to follow along with the counter on the screen and hold that ah uh, using that good loudness and quality for as long as you can. So when the light turns green, let's get ready to do an ah. Uh. So if you were doing that video on your own at home, the video would continue to go for about 30 seconds and you just take a breath and continue to do that ah, uh, and then it repeats several times. So that's a tool that can be used for helping and, and this also video also um, includes the highs and lows and the phrases and some reading practice. Next slide please. So in this slide, we're looking at a little bit more about the speech hierarchy. So as I mentioned earlier, the second half of the session be involves the speech hierarchy, and we start simple at word phrase level and gradually get more complex in conversation. It's very important in this part of the session that all the reading and conversational activities are personal and salient to the individuals that we're working with. So this is how we get generalization and carryover outside of the treatment room. The, when I first meet someone, I'm asking them, what are their hobbies? What are their interests? What do they like to do? And then all of my reading and conversation activities are focused on that. So for example, um, I actually had an individual once who was interested in astrophysics. And so week one, we read words and phrases about astrophysics. Week two, we had sentence level information, words and definitions about astrophysics. Week three, he could bring in materials that were interesting to him about astrophysics. And week four, we could talk about his um, relationship and experiences with astrophysics. I've had other people who enjoy baking and all of our materials are about baking or someone else may enjoy wine and all of our materials are about wine. So it's very important that we pick things that are interesting and salient so there is the opportunity for generalization outside of the treatment room. Next slide please. Beth introduced you earlier to this idea that in Parkinson's disease it's not just a motor component that we're focused on in the treatment. So we do, of course, as I just showed you, have exercises to work on improving and strengthening voice and speech and getting to normal loudness. 
But it's very important that we also, in treatment, focus on that sensory mismatch that Beth mentioned to you. So we do a lot of tape recording our patients' voices and playing them back so individuals can see that the voice that feels normal to them is really quiet and the voice that feels too loud is really normal loudness. This diagram that you see is one that we use frequently in treatment. Um, typically, how I would use this is I would have just played back um, one of my patients' voice and, and and you know they may comment on it feels so funny that the voice that feels normal to me I can hear on the tape is really quiet and I can hear on the tape that the voice that feels too loud to me is really normal loudness. Why is that? Well an explanation is before Parkinson's disease your voice is at a normal loudness level so if you want to get loud or to a shout you increase your effort one or two steps. But now with Parkinson's, your voice may be at the soft or perhaps even very soft range. So if you want to get to normal loudness, you have to increase your effort one or perhaps even two steps to get to normal loudness. But that's why to you, that increased effort makes it feel like you're at loud or a shout. And so this is a tool that we can use to help explain that sensory mismatch. Next slide, please. What we tell our patients is, if you don't feel like you're talking too loud, you're not talking loud enough. Next slide, please. So an important part of LSVT Loud is retraining the sensory system so that our patients can learn on their own how to generate or internally cue this voice that requires them to get to normal loudness. So for some individuals it may take more effort than others to get to that normal loudness level. But we do a lot, as I mentioned, of playing back tape recordings of the voice. We give our patients activities to practice outside of the treatment room using the new normal loudness voice so that individuals can see that even though the voice feels too loud to them, it really is the response they're getting from other people is, no, you sound great, I can hear you now, I can understand you, you are not too loud. And so this is a very important part of therapy. And then helping people learn to target or what we call internally cue that voice on their own without cues from the, us as therapists. Next slide, please. So you've seen the research and heard about LSVT loud and what happens when we increase amplitude at the level of the motor speech system. But what would happen if we take these same principles and apply them to limb movement? Next slide, please. So let's talk now about the translation of LSVT loud to LSVT big. After many years using LSVT loud in the treatment of voice and speech and Parkinson's disease, LSVT big was developed through a collaboration of the LSVT research team and researchers from the University of Arizona. So the idea is taking these same ideas, same principles, and applying them to limb movement. Next slide. So what you see in this slide is a sketch that was made by an LSVT big workshop patient volunteer who had Parkinson's disease. He was so moved after just a one hour demonstration session that he sketched this on a napkin. So his perception of his movement before attending the practicum is on the left. And as you see, after his one hour long session, his perception of himself was much different. So notice not only did he sketch his stride to be long and his arm swing is big, but he was going faster, standing up straighter, and even looked happier. So in the clinic, these um, are the types of changes that our therapists see over and over again when they're using the LSVT big treatment. Next slide. So just as LSVT loud needs to be delivered by a speech therapist who has been trained and certified in the treatment approach to make sure they're delivering it as it's been researched, LSVT big also needs to be delivered by physical and occupational therapists who have attended an LSVT big training and certification workshop. This is really important so that our therapists are delivering the treatments in a consistent manner that's based on the protocols that were researched. So just like LSVT loud, LSVT big is four times a week for four weeks, 16 sessions in one month. Each session is one hour in length. Their daily carryover and homework assignments, and the, the intervention is given one-on-one. -on -one. It's really important that this is not delivered in a group setting. Next slide, please. 
The sensory mismatch that Beth mentioned previously in relation to voice also exists for limb movement. So we see the same mismatch between the online perception of output and how others perceive it. So this is demonstrated by the quotes you see here from patients. I had no idea how small my world had become. And then when we get people to normal movement, I can't move like this. People will think I'm crazy. So it's this idea that the normal movement feels too big. And so sensory calibration is incorporated into LSVT big as well to help individuals see that, nope, it's, the movement is not too big, it's normal movement. Let's now watch a video demonstration of pre-post LSVT big. In the video, you're going to um, be seeing a 71-year-old um, gentleman. And um, we're going to just talk you through the video. And you'll see pre on the left-hand side and post on the right-hand side. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. So pre, you can see this individual has a cane. Post, there's no cane. Pre, you can see shorter stride length. Post, longer stride length. You can see the differences in the arm swing between pre and post. You can see the difference in gait velocity. The post video, that gentleman is already out the door. Pre, same person, is um, having a little bit of a freezing episode in the doorway, um, getting stuck and having difficulty turning. Whereas in this, um, using the same timing on the post video, already to the parking lot. And here in the parking lot. So when we actually. in this study and the patients were assigned to um, the walking group and received 16 sessions of that or um, so sorry the patients who were assigned to the walking group received 16 sessions two times a week for eight weeks and each session lasted one hour and consisted of some standardized protocol including warming up practicing Nordic walking and cooling down Patients assigned to the home program received a one-hour instruction um, with practical demonstration and, tra and training, and then the LSVT big was four times a week for four weeks. So what you can see here is looking at UPDRS scores, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, and on this scale, a decrease in a score indicates improvement. So. As you can see from the graph, the LSVT big group was the only one that showed improvement from the baseline to the four-week mark and continued um, to show some improvements throughout the course of the study. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to turn it back over to Beth, and she's going to talk to you about some future directions with programs and technology. All right, great. Thanks so much, Angela. So on this next slide, you see just a couple pictures um, that, that show you some of the technology that's been developed. And this is the technology we're looking at to help make LSVT Loud as accessible as possible to both, both individuals wishing to receive treatment and to speech clinicians. So on the left, you see an image depicting LSVT eLoud, which is telepractice delivery of LSVT Loud. So the patient sits at home or their office on their computer, and the speech clinician is in their, their clinic or their home office, and you use either you use some type of internet software, such as um, Skype has been used in the past, but there's, there's been more development since that. But you're using your internet collection, so basically you're beaming in and your speech clinician delivers LSVT loud over the internet. So today there are 
um, multiple published articles that document LSVT Loud delivered over telepractice is as efficacious um, as treatment that's delivered face to face. Um, so that's exciting as it gives us the confidence to know that we don't have to diminish our treatment fidelity when we use technology over the internet. The other technology that's been developed, and that's what you see here on the right side, and that's actually Angela here in the picture, and that's a computer program that was funded by the National Institutes of Health and the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and it can deliver treatment sessions, or it can help with homework sessions or follow-up practice, and that's called the LSVT Companion. And here's some data that were um, collected on when patients did use the LSVT Companion. And this data shows you um, when 16 sessions of treatment were completed, but nine of the sessions were done in person and seven were done on the LSVT Companion. And you'll see here in, we have purple, um, the peach and the yellow, um, and we see for a sustained phonation all the way through a cognitive task. Um, and so we see improvements, improvements from pre to post. These are all the individuals that were using the LSVT Companion for, for some of their sessions. And then the yellow goes to six month follow up. So we see those improvements from pre to post and then also maintaining out to six months. So this is showing us that the changes were consistent with those reported when all 16 sessions of treatment were done face to face. So again, using the LSVT Companion for some of the treatment sessions did not reduce the, um, the fidelity of treatment. So we had the same types of outcomes. If you were interested in doing this type of uh, method using the LSVT Companion for some treatment sessions, you would need to read the article that's been published um, with this data to see the exact methods that, uh, that the authors followed. Um, because there was a very specific way to do these methods to make sure that um, not all of the sessions were first done on the LSVT Companion without any in, in person sessions. Um, so you just want to follow those methods to make sure that you can expect the same types of results. So this is just a quick video we'll show you of what the LSVT Companion looks like so that you can, you can see what that program um, does look like. So let's go ahead and look at that video. Welcome to a demonstration of the LSVT Companion Home or Client version. This program can be used by individuals with Parkinson's disease or other neural conditions who are receiving LSVT treatment. The program can be used by clients for their homework practice, or it can be used actually to deliver an entire independent treatment session, either within the clinician's clinic or at home by the client. This is the welcome screen for the program, and the client can choose to display data or not. They'll click Start Exercises, and then follow the prompts through the program. Okay, let's get ready. Let's do those loud odds. Uh... Okay, so just a quick demonstration so you can see what that's like. It takes you through all the treatment exercises, so the ahs, the highs and lows, functional phrases, and also reading and conversation. So in summary, to wrap up the webinar today, we've seen that advances in neuroscience have provided evidence that supports the positive impact of exercise protocols in individuals with Parkinson's disease. We've also seen that the LSVT programs have been developed and studied for the past 20 plus years and that LSVT Loud has well-established efficacy and is considered the level one evidence for speech treatment in Parkinson's. LSVT Big is one type of physical and occupational therapy program that does have the potential to offer improvements in movement and quality of life for people with Parkinson's. And then we've also seen how technology can assist with accessibility of LSVT Loud. 
If you are an individual with Parkinson's disease or another neurological condition, we've listed on this slide how you can get started with LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. First, we recommend asking your doctor for a referral. Um, it can also be helpful to actually get a prescription um, for a speech and physical or occupational therapy evaluation and treatment. And you can use our website, so lsvtglobal.com, to find LSVT Loud and LSVT Big certified clinicians in your area. And with LSVT Loud, we also have LSVT E Loud listed. Um, so if you are interested in telepractice delivery, that's an option. And then the slide or the video that Angela showed you um, with the DVD, so that was when you practiced the AH when you saw that stoplight. Um, that's available too. We have them for both LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. Um, if you do, we, we have it on our website, but we also have it on the Amazon store. So if you go to the Amazon store, there's usually better shipping prices. So that's where we would recommend if you wanted to purchase it that you would you would went to Amazon um, to get the best price there. Um, so we'll leave you with a quote. Um, if my possessions were taken from me, with one exception, I would choose to keep the power of communication. For by it, I would soon regain all the West rest. And that's a quote by Daniel Webster. And so that really just shows you how powerful communication is. Um, so I know we're at the end of our hour, um, but we'll go ahead. If you do have questions, feel free to, to answer or to write those questions in. You can do that by typing in um, the question box on your control panel or by raising your hand. And then we'll stay on for about... Uh, 10 or so more minutes to, to make sure that we can address these questions. Um, and if you do have to sign off, this handout, again, is available in the handout um, tab on your webinar control panel. It will also be emailed to you after the webinar um, to make sure that everybody is able to receive a copy. All right, so I have had a few questions come in. Um, okay, so let's just take these as they've come in. And Angela, if you want to go ahead and take this first question, um, are, do you have any suggestions on how you can motivate a person with Parkinson's disease to complete the treatments? Yeah, so, you know, it is a shift sometimes for people thinking, oh, four times a week for four weeks, that sounds intensive. And um, that is one of the reasons the treatment works. When we look at theories of neuroplasticity, is that you need intensity um, to make change and you know we hypothesize it's one reason previous treatments didn't work was because they weren't intensive so typically once individuals come in and they've done a session or two and hear those changes in their voice and speech which can be pretty astounding pretty quickly that we can achieve in the treatment room with external cueing um, that's a big motivation and so you know what um, sometimes, typically when people come to see me just after the assessment, they're, they're hooked, they want to start. But if someone seems to be a little more resistive, um, I'll say, you know, just come in for a week. Let's see those kinds of changes um, that you might see in a week. And, and then, like I said, usually after a session or two and the feedback people are getting about how great they sound, that's all the motivation someone needs to continue. And the other thing is that it might be four times a week for four weeks and one month, but then you're done in one month. It's not like other treatments which are spread out over two months or three months. Um, so you just get it done in that one month um, and then you're finished. And most of the times our patients will be surprised. They'll say, wow, I can't believe we're already halfway through treatment or wow, this month just flew by. Um, so those would be some suggestions. Oh, so one other point. Um, the other thing I think is helpful is to show people the video like Beth showed of the pre-post LSVT loud that's available on our website. Um, so individuals can see those pre-post changes and also to let them know of the over 25 years plus of research data behind the treatment approach. All right, great. Thanks, Angela. Some great tips for, for motivation there. So this one, the next question says, where do we go to find out where to take the LSVT class? Um, so if you're an individual with Parkinson's or interested in receiving the treatment, you can go to our website, so lsvtglobal.com, and click on Find a Clinician. And that will show you, you'll, you'll see ways to search for either LSVT Loud, LSVT E Loud, so that telepractice delivery, or LSVT Big certified clinicians in your area. And then you'll get set up through them with doing either one of those treatment programs. Um, so that's how you get started. On that 
previous slide, you did see how I did recommend talking to your neurologist first to get that uh, evaluation and um, the treatment prescription that can help with reimbursement purposes. Um, but you can certainly contact those clinicians directly to, to help get started also. So if you go to lsvtglobal.com and click on find a clinician, um, that's how you can see who in your area is certified to deliver the treatment. If you were asking as a clinician how you go about getting certified, clinicians can go to our website, so lsvtglobal.com, and click on either LSVT Loud or LSVT Big, depending on what your profession is. And then from that page, you'll see a list of all our upcoming live workshops where you can get trained and certified. You'll also see a tab there that says online courses, and you can now take both those courses, LSVT Loud and LSVT Big Online, and that's for the professionals, either the speech pathologists or the physical and occupational therapists. That's where you'd go if you're interested in becoming certified. Okay, um, so Angela, if you'd like to take this next one, um, can LSVT Loud benefit patients, or I should say LSVT loud or big, benefit patients without a confirmed diagnosis of Parkinson disease, um, but are experiencing hypokinetic dysarthria. So sorry, this one is about LSVT loud. What we train the clinicians to do in our treatment sessions, so we have over 25 plus years of data on idiopathic Parkinson's disease, but um, therapists also ask about applications to other neurological disorders, so this would be an example of that. We do have some um, case studies and small group studies for applications to other disorders. We've done things with um, stroke, multiple sclerosis. We've had some applications to kids with CP and Down syndrome. But so with anyone who doesn't have a confirmed diagnosis, what we train the therapist how to do is what we call stimulability testing. So they walk through a specific um, set of steps to look at would LSVT loud be appropriate for this particular person. So if there isn't a confirmed diagnosis, you could still contact a certified therapist and um, say, you know, I don't have a confirmed diagnosis, just wondering if you could do the stimulability testing to see if maybe this treatment might be appropriate for me. All right, great. Thanks, Angela. Um, so the next question, can the article be found on the website to use the LSVT companion in treatment sessions? Um, so we, we aren't able to put the actual article on our website, but we do have the full citation. Um, so if you go to LS, or lsvtglobal.com and um, click on, I want to say it's the it says professionals, something like professionals tab, then you'll see a link to our full reference list. Um, so you can see the link to all the references regarding LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. And it'll also include that LSVT Companion article, and that was Halpern in 2012. Um, and if you are a speech language pathologist and, you, and you're um, a member of ASHA, then you'll have access, free access to the journal that has that article. Um, so you should be able to get that um, by logging in through through your ASHA login. Um, so again, that's on our website, lsvtglobal.com, and I wanna say it, it says something like professional resources. You click on that and then you can find the link for that full citation or the, the full bibliography of all our resources, and then that will include the citation for that LSVT companion article. All right, um, Angela, if you wanna take this next one, does it matter how far post diagnosis of Parkinson's disease that a patient completes LSVT for the best results? It, we um, are able to work with individuals of all stages of Parkinson's disease, but certainly the early when um, voice and speech symptoms aren't as severe, it's easier for the individual doing the treatment. It doesn't require much effort to get to normal loudness as it does later in treatment. Calibration is a little easier because you're not having to jump from such a big level to get to that normal loudness to um, keep the voice and speech strong for years to come. The speech therapy relationship is a lifelong relationship with our patients. So at six months, how are things going? Do you need a little tune-up session? Uh, 
continue to practice to keep their voice and speech strong. So it's not to say that can't benefit from the treatment, um, but it may be um, more difficult than treatment. And you know, for some very severe patients, it may be we're looking more phrase level with cueing, things like that, rather than this ease of loudness and conversational speech. However, all levels of improvement are important for people to have function to be able to communicate their thoughts and ideas. All right, great. Thanks, Angela. Um, the next one, can LSVT be delivered as group therapy? Um, so the short answer to that is no. Um, for both LSVT Loud and LSVT Big, it's very important that the treatment sessions are personal and they're individualized to each patient's individual needs. Um, so um, not only to make sure that patients are working as hard as possible, so they're, we're getting to the high effort level of each individual patient, but you also saw that process of calibration is so important, so we really need to make sure that we're tailoring the, in, the, the materials, um, the effort levels, the, the types of cueing that we use to individual patients um, for both LSVT Big and LSVT Loud to make sure that we get the best results. Um, but I'll say that after treatment, you can certainly do support in groups. Um, and Angela is actually working very hard on one of our programs that we're trying to develop called Loud for Life. And that is a group program that's done after people complete LSVT Loud individually. And then they come to these groups um, to basically get, get support and get, uh, they continue to do their exercises and practice after treatment has concluded. And we've had other, um, lots of other clinics and clinicians tell us that they do kind of group support like this after treatment has concluded where they do help people maintain continuing to practice. Um, and it's good to have that, again, kind of that support of other patients um, in their group with them. We're also working on a similar program for LSBT Big called Big for Life, where after treatment, patients can come together and, and do their exercises and practice together in, in more of a structured setting. And Angela, since you are working on that, I don't know if you wanted to add in anything um, related to that. You gave a really nice overview, and um, we're hoping to have more information, a training program for certified speech um, language pathologists available by spring um, so they could see how to, um, we'd have information on the protocol and the types of activities that were done, but um, I've had a wonderful, wonderful time with the group I've been running since July, and um, you know, people are saying even after coming a few sessions, oh, this is reminding me to practice more, you know, I, I've had fallen off the wagon a bit with my practicing and now I've started to do that. And um, people also say it's just fun to come in an environment where everyone has been through the same thing. They understand what's going on with the voice and speech and they can give each other support and understand um, the challenges of going through of remembering to think loud and, and celebrate people's successes when they have been loud. And, um, and the activities we've done have been a lot of fun um, as well. So. Stay tuned for more to come about that. All right, great. Thanks, Angela. That's very exciting. All right, so it looks like we have a few more questions, so we'll stand for just a few more minutes to address these. Um, Angela, if you want to take this next one, have you used LSVT Loud with a patient with spasmodic dysphonia? I personally have not, so I cannot speak directly to that. Um, that could be a question um, that if you want to provide Beth with your email and information that we could get a little more information for you about that. Um, so, you know, that we could see if there's other clinicians out there who have, but I personally have not. Yeah, I also haven't. That is a great question. Um, if you are an LSVT Loud certified clinician, we have a forum on our website where you can address all other LSVT Loud certified clinicians and ask that question to see if others have. Um, if you're not an LSVT Loud certified clinician, um, that would be a great, as Angela said, a great question for our expert of the month to address a little bit more um, and see if um, they have more experience with the spasmodic dysphonia or or have more information for you. So I do have your email address that came through with your question. Um, but again, it's not something that, that I've used it with and it sounds like Angela hasn't either. Um, if you have had a patient that has advanced Parkinson's and consistently complains of fatigue negatively impacting their ability to be loud during the day, how do you handle that? 
Um, so that's a that's a great question. So you might not only just experience that with people that have advanced Parkinson's, but sometimes um, that happens throughout all stages with Parkinson disease. Um, so I'll address this question, I guess, in two ways. So the first is to say, if you're working with someone that has advanced Parkinson's disease, um, you may never get to the same kind of end result of treatment as you would with someone in an earlier stage, such as stages one through three, um, where with individuals that are stages one through three on the Hone and Yar scale for, um, for Parkinson's disease, we expect them to be able to use this new loud voice all the time in every conversation um, that they participate in. With someone who's more advanced, so maybe a Parkinson plus syndrome or later on in the disease, so maybe a stage four or five, um, it might be that by the end of treatment, they can use their loud voice at a phrase level, but they may need um, additional cueing to be loud in, in certain types of conversation activities. Um, so just kind of, I guess, addressing that question in two parts, you may see different end results for those that are further um, further advanced in, in the disease or, again, have a Parkinson plus or something more advanced. Um, so in terms of your question more about fatigue, um, so fatigue can again happen for any stage of the disease with, with any of these patients. Um, so the way I would handle that is showing them that through treatment and kind of explaining to them that uh, we're, we're working to build up healthy fatigue. So they, they should feel fatigued when they are using this loud voice um, because it should feel like a workout for them. Um, so just as if you go to the gym and you work out your muscles, you should feel sore at the end of a workout, which shows you that you've worked really hard, but you shouldn't feel pain. So it shouldn't be painful, but it should feel sore. So they should have this kind of healthy fatigue associated with um, the in intensive and high effort treatment approach. Um, but I would also explain to them that during the course of treatment, just as if you worked out every day for 16 sessions, um, you would gradually um, see improvements in that fatigue. So you wouldn't feel quite as fatigued um, as, as you've worked harder. So the same thing with this voice treatment. Um, so that by the end of 16 sessions, they wouldn't feel as fatigued as they did at the beginning because now they've built up their endurance to use this loud voice um, through through conversational speech. Um, so that's exactly why we work in a hierarchy faction. Why week one, we work on using the loud voice at the word or short phrase level and gradually progress to week four where we use that conversational level um, to be loud. Um, because they, they will experience fatigue if they jumped in right away and tried to use their loud voice all the time. So you can let them know that throughout the course of treatment, they should expect to have less fatigue um, as, as they go through uh, the treatment approach. Um, and I guess one other analogy, another kind of sports analogy, if you were to run a marathon, you would build up your endurance to run that marathon as opposed to not training at all and then going out the next day and running that marathon. Um, so it's the same way with the voice and speech. So with this program, um, they'll feel fatigue. It should be healthy fatigue, not pain. And by the end of the program, they should be able to use this loud voice um, and have much less fatigue, if any fatigue, by using this loud voice all the time. So hopefully I address that. Um, I know I kind of went on and on, but hopefully that makes sense, um, both in terms of working with advanced patients and then also how the fatigue should change throughout the course of treatment. All right, um, the next one, so Angela, if you want to take this one, if a patient complains of having worsening or hoarse voice quality after LSVT loud, what could we do to assist with this or what could be the issue? Well, the first thing is, and, and we um, heavily stress this in training with the therapists that we're working with, is that um, patients should never notice any strain with their voice or tension with their voice or um, worsening of the voice when doing LSVT loud because LSVT loud is only training healthy voice use and quality. So um, if a patient is noticing that um, the voice feels strained or there's a different quality, then um, my first response is asking really make sure you're checking in to make sure you're not letting any um, tension or 
behaviors persist during the treatment that um, would be causing involve loud good quality with the treatment techniques and the patient is not getting too loud um, so we're only training healthy vocal loudness we're not getting, um, at a too loud level so if the treatment is done according to the protocol and according to how therapists are trained there shouldn't be any um, adverse effect or any changes um, you know hoarseness other things that the individual notices it's also important that people follow good vocal hygiene um, staying well hydrated because we're doing a lot of vocal exercises so making sure people are um, getting good vocal hydration and so sometimes that needs to be addressed as well if it's an acute onset of a voice change and only healthy voice quality has been allowed to happen in treatment, then we, um, a therapist would need to probe into what's going on outside of treatment. So um, are the patients practicing in the same good way, using the same um, healthy voice techniques that have been used in the treatment room? And so um, having the patient maybe call while doing their homework or uh, make a recording of themselves while doing the homework to make sure they're only using healthy voice production. Um, and if it's an immediate change, it might be something that needs to be seen by a doctor. So maybe there's a the person's having a virus or there's something else going on with the voice that needs to be checked out. Beth, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I think that was really great, a really helpful response. So thank you, Angela. Um, and it looks like we've addressed all the questions, so thanks so much um, for submitting these great questions. If you do have additional questions, you can always email us, and that's info at lsvtglobal.com, and we're happy to take those questions um, at any time. So thanks so much for being with us. We hope that you're able to join us another time uh, for a future webinar. All right, take care. Bye.